Hello, I'm Colin Sullivan. And I'm Pepper Raper. And this is Almost Live, a weekly show designed to give you the who's who and what's what of Telluride in Mountain Village. In today's show, Catherine Warren brings us her Warren Commission for news on our local music and entertainment scene. We'll also have conversations with Mark Galbo, uh, who founded the Rock and Roll Academy, and local rapper Lionel Starr, a.k.a. Lift Ticket. Patrick Gagans, the wine geek food freak, is back, and he's got a lovely mango scallop dish for us. And then we have an edgy piece on knife techniques from local chef Lucas Price of La Cucina de Luz. Patrick Latcham will bring us the Telluride Mountain Report, and we will have a retro ride throwback to a 2004 Kodo lip sync. The Kodo News team is back with Kodo Radio Vision News, and Diva Chasonis takes us undercover with Between the Covers for news on new book releases. And we have a local business profile from the AHA School for the Arts. For now, let's join Colin and Catherine for this week's Warren Commission. Thanks a lot, Pepper. And we're here in the new year with Catherine Warren and her Warren Commission. Happy New Year, Colin. Happy New Year, Catherine. It's continuing, thank God. Yes, it is. Uh, we've got a, a brief uh, pause in the events, not as okay. many events happening this weekend, yeah. which is probably good because I think locals and visitors need to take a break, yep. after myself included, yep. after the last week. And um, But there's still some, some fun things to do. So don't fret, folks. And you have them in your little black book. Uh huh. I had to get a new little black book because oh. we've just had so many events to talk about since the Amazing. show started. Amazing. <laughs> That's great. Um, on Friday at four o'clock at the Liberty, Alex Paul is playing a free mm. apres ski set. Nice. Great local singer songwriter. Super engaging on stage. Mm -hmm. Such a nice guy too, but uh, a great, great musician. Mm -hmm. That's free. Uh, later on Friday night, we have bluegrass, bluegrass rock legends. Uh, Railroad Earth playing at the Opera House. Right. Tickets sold out a while ago. Sold out, yeah. Yep, but if folks are really jumping to go, you can um, come when the doors open at 8 o'clock. Put your fingers out. See how many tickets yeah. people are trying to resell. Sometimes, Bring some cash. <laughs> yeah, go and tell your real deals, tell your sweet deals. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people try to offload their tickets. Like, often not yeah. everybody shows up. People get sick, can't make mm -hmm. it. They want to uh, un uh, unload their tickets. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're patient... Um, you might be able to get in. Right. Uh, if you don't make it into Railroad Earth on Friday night, we have Magpie playing at the Liberty. Oh. It's a $5 suggested donation. Former Telluride resident. Yeah. Kind of folk rock vibes. Yeah, that's right. I, I Actually, you can go on um, Spotify right now and see. Um, it's it's great. It's, it's really good songwriting. Um, mm -hmm. Zach. Zach, mm -hmm. is the, Zach is the guy who is doing Magpie. And they've actually been touring around. He yeah. and this other guy. So they're coming um, back to Telluride to yeah. show the friends here what, what they've been up to lately. That's wonderful. And then on Saturday night, a funk, blues, acoustic fusion band called the Cosmonauts mm. play a free show at the Liberty starting around 9 o'clock and through the evening. Man, funk, blues, acoustic fusion, bluegrass, whatever, yeah. whatever. Just throw all the adjectives Throw it in all there. in there. <laughs> Folks will be there, yep. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Catherine. Yeah, thanks for having me, Colin. Um, let's check out a profile now on the AHA School for the Arts. Art connects us with the human spirit. Art is freedom. Art enriches us. Art matters. AHA is the sound of insight and discovery. People come to the AHA school and have AHA moments where they discover something new about themselves and about their work. When we provide AHA moments for our students here, we're providing them a venue for discovering something for the first time or discovering something in a new light. The AHA School for the Arts is a dynamic creative center in Telluride, Colorado. We've been in existence for 25 years and we offer classes for both children and adults in all the creative arts. One of our key programs is the American Academy of Bookbinding. It's been in existence since 1993 and students come from all over the world to study the fine craft and art of bookbinding, bookmaking, conservation, and related subjects. Our adult AHA program is open to all experience levels with classes ranging from two hours to two weeks long. We have classes in everything from plein air painting to ceramics to jewelry making to car maintenance. Our visiting artist program brings celebrated artists from around the country to come teach at AHA. These classes allow students to refine their skills, hone their craft, and find their own creative voice. In addition to our adult programming, we also have a huge variety of programs for kids. 
What AHA really specializes in is offering kids things that they don't normally experience already in school or at home. Children are natural artists and that's really what we're trying to embrace here. Most important though is that kids have a lot of fun. In addition to classes, the AHA School offers a wide array of exhibitions, events, and lectures throughout the year. These are open to the public and usually free. Our biggest fundraising event of the year takes place every summer in July. It's the AHA Art Auction. It raises money for the school's many programs and is a fun, exciting, and fabulous event. Whether you're a beginner or an experienced artist, the AHA School has something for everyone. Well, that was a wonderful little piece that we saw there on the AHA School for the Arts. You can find them on aha.org if you want to sign up for any of those classes. We are here now with Mark Galbo, the founder, the proprietor, the brainchild of the Rock and Roll Academy. Yes, sir. Happy, Happy New, New for, Year, Mark. Happy New Year. Thanks for having me. Um, let's just start with how did you come to Telluride? We ask everybody this because Telluride's an out-of-the-way place, and you came here and started a rock and roll legacy with children. Yes, sir. So I had been living in quite a few places, New York City, Los Angeles, Vermont, San Francisco. Uh, when Jessica and I got married, we uh, visited Monticello, Utah, mm -hmm. um, and we thought we were going to stay there for Christmas, and mm -hmm. we ended up staying there five years and having three children. Amazing. Um, somewhere in there, we heard Kodo. And uh, I had tried my best to retire from the music scene, and, mm -hmm. and we heard Kodo, and I heard Steve Gumbel. Um, and I heard the artists that he had, many of whom that I had worked with, and I wrote the number down and uh, then didn't really do anything. A few weeks later, Jessica called him up, uh -huh. and Steve said, hey, we're looking for an acoustic blues type thing with our festival. Oh. Um, would your husband be able to do that? And I had done quite a bit of that work. So it was through Blues and Brews that I came here. And then I met Dave Lamb at the music store, and every year Dave would say, we should teach some guitar students here. Yeah. Um, it took three years, but then I started teaching guitar, commuting from Monticello, Utah to Telluride, mm -hmm. 134.4 miles each way. Um, and um, very quickly, uh, Uli Sir Jesse gave me all their students, the AHA school. All of a sudden, I had an awful lot of students. Then mm -hmm. I met Daniel Tucker in Norwood, mm -hmm. who, uh, who said, well, uh, looks like you could use a house. So uh, we ended up moving to Norwood and then moved to Telluride in 2003, which was the same year that I found at Rock and Roll Academy right here actually in Mountain Village. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the short answer is magic and hard work, it seems like. And a lot of <laughs> children. You have four children in yeah. addition to your full-time job. Yeah, I don't have a job. I have, I'm not sure what it is. It's a mission, a vocation. <laughs> it's uh, it's um, uh, an entrepreneurial uh, you know, adventure. And um, let me just back up really quickly because you mentioned that you you mentioned that you were done with music before you came here. I did and my best. That yeah. was, and that was um, and that is to say, you were a professional musician for many years. Yes, for uh, yeah, for many years, uh, sixteen years more or less full time. Traveled, played in bands, TV, radio. I wrote books. I, I did everything. Uh, but one thing I did was I did a lot of teaching. Uh, you know, in and out of schools as an artist in residence. I taught a guitar program on the Navajo Reservation, actually in Monument Valley, Arizona, which is where I kind of came up with some of my concepts for Rock and Roll Academy. And I really noticed the difference between what I was experienced as a professional musician, mm -hmm. uh, how we played, how we learned, how we worked together, and, and how kids were um, kind of, you know, with their musical experience inside mm -hmm. of schools. So I just kind of wanted to combine my world as a professional musician, as an artist, a collaborator, a creator, uh, with with uh, working with children. I didn't mm -hmm. want to work with children in a linear, um, in a linear fashion anyway. And I wanted, I wanted to empower them as artists and individuals. So, so talk a little bit about that because um, a, a lot of, and we're going to see a clip here in a second, um, which explains a little bit about what's going on in the Rock and Roll Academy. But I've been there in the academy um, uh, for classes, and I've also seen um, the product, which is like you have your 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 end product is not a is not a fill in the bubbles test. Your end product is a, is a rock and roll concert, and it's a real concert. So tell me a little bit about. How, about the idea and the philosophy behind the academy. Thank you for asking. Um, so my main goal in working with children is autonomy, self-directing freedom, and especially moral independence. I think that's the best reason to work with children. Um, I noticed a lot of similarities between children and artists um, in, in all those years working with one foot in both of those worlds. And, and the difference I noticed was that children didn't really have the capacity or power to say no. 
Um, if an artist doesn't want to do something, they say no. An artist may do something they don't want to do, but they'll get paid for it. Um, children have the same artistic capacities for collaboration, mm -hmm. creativity, um, problem solving, uh, what, what is known now as 21st century learning skills. Mm -hmm. um, so what I really wanted to do was I wanted to create and protect a space where kids could be empowered um, to collaborate and express themselves. Um, I also removed what I considered the impediment of written music. Okay. So uh, by making the learning process strictly an oral process, mm -hmm. um, it becomes intrinsically a social mm -hmm. uh, process, and that's what I wanted, peer-to-peer -peer learning. I wanted to move the adult to the periphery of the room, mm -hmm. um, take the burden off the, off the teacher to always have to know everything and be in charge. So we really have facilitation of a, of a natural process, which is also very much like a hero's journey. So mm -hmm. kids kind of start in their normal life, then they have some adventure, and they learn all these things, and they mm -hmm. face the trials. Then they come back to their community with the gift um, in the concert, mm -hmm. if that answers your question. It does answer my question. <laughs> and we can actually, um, uh, if you want to see it, we're going to um, cut to a clip real quick. And um, this is you speaking on the clip, and we can see some of the kids in action here. But also, I would encourage anybody, I mean, if you want to see, if you wanna see the, the result, you know, just go to one of the concerts. There are several uh, throughout the year, aren't there? Yes, and we also uh, work with the Wild West Fest. So we uh, work with the group of kids every year. We've been doing that almost 10 years. So uh, during the Wild West Fest, we also do a little show at the Sheridan Opera House. Great. Let's take a look at that clip. When you walk into Rock and Roll Academy, it's easy to see it's not like other classrooms. The walls are red and blue, the lighting is nice, and all the instruments are just sitting there waiting for you to play them. Rock and Roll Academy is a music program that delivers social emotional learning through the vehicle of student-led bands. Students choose their own music, work collaboratively, and learn through play and exploration. Rock and Roll Academy is intentionally set up to create and protect a space where kids can make choices, take ownership of their learning, and develop independence of thought and spirit. The best learning emerges from supportive relationships and a sense of belonging. How a person feels has a lot to do with how a person learns. Students who participate in social emotional learning programs are more likely to stay in school and achieve more academically. Rock and Roll Academy develops creativity, communication, collaboration, and critical thinking skills, the cornerstones of 21st century learning. Seek mystery, not answers. Well, that was a pretty interesting little clip there, but again, I encourage you to go see them live. So. Um, the last thing that I really want to ask you about is you started this program in Telluride, but now um, you wrote a book uh, about your curriculum and you also um, licensed this to other schools around the nation, right? Yes, sir. So we've had the opportunity to work with over 30 schools in six different states. Rock and Roll Academy is actually an accredited course mm -hmm. in the state of California, mm. um, which was a big deal to get that. And uh, so we, we go in and we work with schools. And, and I had to learn the fundamental lesson that um, we don't get to the children without serving the adults. Um, so meeting all the tremendous people who work in public schools as servant leaders and working to professionally develop teachers and co-construct curriculums with them. So yeah, I license the curriculum and and now we have our sights set on Southern California and Texas. Amazing. So if I wanted to get in touch with you about licensing this curriculum, how would I do that? Uh, you could go to rockandrollacademy.com. Uh, you could also just call me up 970-708-1140. There you go. He's accessible, guys. Mark, happy 2018. Thank you, nice sir. Nice chatting with you. Tell Your ITV is a public access channel that depends on public support. We want to give a special shout out to a few of our most generous supporters, the towns of Telluride Mountain Village, the Telluride Foundation, and the Telluride Ski and Golf Corporation. We couldn't do without you guys. Thanks a lot. And now let's go over to the wine geek food freak Patrick Legans with, for a lovely mango scallop dish. Hi, I'm Patrick Legans, the wine geek food freak. Today I went to my local market, found some beautiful mangoes. I also went over to the fish department in our local Clark's Market and found some beautiful scallops. So today we're going to get to learn how to sear scallops properly as well as make a delicious mint fruit sauce. So far I've taken one mango, I've cut it up, I've placed it in about two cups of water with one cup of sugar and I've just reduced it for about 15 minutes. Now I'm going to take it, 
put it in my Vitamix. I like to pulse it just to see that it's okay. Now we're good to go. So now I'm gonna just do this for about 15, 20 seconds. All right, now we can start the scallops. If you ever see the Shell Oil Company uh, logo, that's what a scallop shell looks like. And they have these little feet on them. Uh, that's the part that comes out and pushes them around in the water. You don't want to eat those, so always make sure that you peel those off. I like to put them on a piece of paper towel. A lot of times they'll throw a lot of liquid out. And if you put liquid in your oil, when you try to sear them, you're never going to get that little crisp edge that you're looking for. I'm going to take some extra virgin olive oil, put that in there, and we'll let it get nice and hot. So, I'm going to take my scallops, put them in there. You don't want to throw salt or anything else in here at this point in time. If you do that, you're going to leach a lot of liquid out. And again, you're not going to get, you're going to cook them, but you're not going to get a nice little crust on them. Okay, now it's been about two minutes. Uh, I'm going to turn the scallops. Look at those. Oh, Lord, that looks good. That's exactly what you want those to look like. Okay, now it's been about another minute and 45 seconds, two minutes. On the other side, let's check them out. Oh, Lord. That's perfect again. So now I'm going to take them out. I like to transfer them onto a little paper towel. Yep, perfect. So I have my scallops on my paper towel. I'm going to start the sauce pan. So I have a pan here. I'm going to take a little bit of butter right there in the pan and just blind that butter. Just make it blind. Next step after blind is brown. Now I'm going to take my mangoes. I'm going to pour them right into my sauce. I'm going to stir that up just for a second here. Looking beautiful. Already nice and getting the perfect consistency right off the bat. I always use white pepper. It's subtle. It doesn't change the color of the dish. Also, I like to just dredge mint through my sauces. So it picks up that mint flavor. But again, I want this to be this beautiful mango color. I don't want green. Now, I'm going to place it right here, right in the center of that plate. Look at that. Woo -hoo -hoo. I'm going to take my beautiful scallops, I'll place those babies right there on top. And you can tell right there, medium rare for sure. I'll take my remainder mint, I'll just do a little quick kind of chiffonade, and, and then I'll spring it the baby. And there you have it, seared scallops and a mango mint sauce. Enjoy. Until next time, remember all you need is good ingredients, some care, and a minute of your time, and you can eat like me, Patrick Legans. The Wine Geek Food Freak. Hi everybody, this is Lucas from La Cocina de Luz. Just wanted to show you a little bit about cutting onions, getting a fine dice. It's really not that complicated. The important thing is to have a sequence and to think in terms of dimensions. So we're going to work in the first dimension. Here, we're going to cut across this way. And we don't need to go all the way through. We're about three quarters of the way through here. We're going to do that a couple of times here, okay? We'll take this onion and we're just going to go down and you'll notice how my fingers are coming over the knife here because I want to hold this onion together while I'm doing this. So I'm cutting this onion and I'm keeping the tip of the blade on the cutting board here and just making small slices. So now I'm going to take this, I'm holding it together over here, being careful not to cut the ends of my fingers off, which has been done before, and I'm going to just move to this and you'll notice with a sharp knife it doesn't make a lot of noise if this is crunching and giving you resistance you need to sharpen your knife and then hit it with the steel so keeping this held together here for the most part moving through the onion and it's going to start breaking down here and s separating but then you just pull it back together now i just read up on on this fine dice is quarter inch and i have my tape measure here See so what we got, and looking pretty darn good there on the quarter inch department. So that's our fine dice. And we're going to continue working on our dicing, our fine dicing, medium dicing, and large dice. So we have a potato here. What we'll do is first of all cut this in. We'll go for our large dice first. Here we go. We're just going to do a quick large dice. Okay, let's get the ruler out and see how, how I did. Well, not bad, I would say, for winging it. Three quarter of an inch. There you go. Now, we'll go for the medium dice, which is half inch. So you can see, it's about a half inch, based on my intuition or guesstimate. So now I'm going to cut it this way, so you can see me here. 
like that, and this one like that, and then just go right down here, going for the half inch cut. The important thing is to have a sequence. Start with one dimension across, and then long ways, and then ac across again to get, your, to get your exact product that you're looking for. So that's pretty darn close to a half inch there, a little over there, 9 16 but we're close. Now we'll go for a fine dice and we'll use the celery here. So what I'm going to do is just cut this lengthwise. And again, what we're looking for is surface area. Because when you're cooking these things, especially when you're making soups and um, sauces, when you, you want to get those sugars coming out of these things, like the onions, carrots, and celery, and potatoes too, produce sugars. And that's what really provides depth to our flavors. Now that we have these strips here, we can take and cut this something like qu a quarter inch wide here. So we're just going to go down here, remembering to keep what? What? The tip of the knife on the cutting board, keeping it grouped together like this. So you are cutting all the celery at the same size as opposed to taking it all apart. And it's more efficient usage of time. So there you have it. A fine dice, quarter inch. We'll get the tape, we'll get the ruler out here and see where we're at. Oh, let's see, that's pretty close here. Really, it's pretty close. So, there you have the fine dice, recipe ready. Thank you so much. Hello, Telluride. This is Patrick Latcham with your Telluride Mountain Report. Today, we're going to talk about terrain, some on mountain activities, and take a look at the weather. First, terrain. Operations has been extremely busy working on snow making and opening up ski in, ski out access into Telluride. I'm very excited to announce that we are going to be opening up lifts eight and nine this Saturday. And with that, it's going to be accompanied by ski in, ski out access to the town of Telluride. Also, on the terrain front, I just have to say I'm extremely grateful for our snowmaking team this past holiday season. They allowed us to open up 12% of our mountain and host over 5,000 skier visits a day with minimal natural snow. And also, I'd like to talk about some on-mountain activities. Garano Ranch is going to be hosting a free beer tasting this Sunday from 1 to 3 p.m with our sponsors Sweetwater Brewing and Telluride Brewing Company. So get over there and celebrate lifts eight and nine opening. And now a quick look at the weather. Very excited that we have some natural snow in the forecast. Snow forecaster Joel Gratz is predicting three to six inches of snow on Saturday night with the snowfall continuing into Monday. And we're back. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Telluride Mountain Report. Look forward to seeing you guys early next week. Thanks, Patrick. Well, let's all keep our fingers crossed for snow. So I'm sitting here with Lionel Starr, AKA Lift Ticket, Telluride's local rapper, um, and who just released a recent video, speaking of snow, is it ever gonna snow? <laughs> so how did this all start? How did you start making videos and when did it begin? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. One I don't really know. Um, I think maybe just having too much time alone on chairlifts. Um, and I've always enjoyed rhyming, I guess. I didn't, I never really, uh, considered myself a rapper, but, um, I guess back, you know, when I started doing this, I just kind of found, um, well, I've kind of started falling in love with some of the rap music that was out. And of course, I fell in love with skiing too, and I thought the two cultures were um, a pretty hilarious, you know, clash. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, there's, a, I guess, there's a certain amount of um, defiance in the ski bone culture, mm -hmm. and I think that's what a lot of rappers really represent. Um, you know, by defiance, I just mean you know people that are that are ski bums have decided to kind of go their own way and and make their own rules, and uh, I thought that you know kind of I just started playing with it you know and 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 it, it turned out to uh, I'd start you know writing a few rhymes and singing them you know to my friends 
late night at the bar usually <laughs> and they usually went over pretty well and uh, just kind of had fun with it and it's just unfortunately it kept doing it so. <laughs> so how many videos do you have on YouTube right now um I think there's three or four that are actual videos and then there's some that were just shot at uh, we did a lot of lip sync performances too uh, so, yeah, so there's a, a fair amount of those out there too so who does your filming is it the whole family affair? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, a lot of times I'll hand the camera to the wife and be like, just try and get this shot or a friend. Uh, a lot of times it's just a GoPro on a ski pole. Uh -huh. um, on the last one I did, I was lucky enough to have a friend that's actually a videographer help me out with it. So nice. moving up <laughs> in the production world, I guess. So it's yeah. getting, getting a little better each time, I hope. <laughs> So do you plan your songs? You know, how do you come up with them? Yeah, that's um, frustration from the snow. Yeah, I don't I don't plan them and I don't uh, try to force anything, you know, like I swore I was not doing any more, you know, ski rapping. And then here we are, you know, <laughs> and after the New Year's come and gone, we haven't seen it, you know, hardly any snow. So uh, the gods just keep giving me material, you know, what am I supposed to do? So, <laughs> is this your version of a snow dance? Like, maybe if I make a video. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a great, I don't know, it's a great outlet. It's a, a great form of self-expression, I guess. But, um, but I don't want to write about, you know, like, I, I guess there have been a couple of times people have asked me to write about something and... Um, you know, I can do that if it Gotta comes, stay true. but yeah, I'm not going to, I don't, I don't really want to force anything. Well, so. speaking of that, let's check it out. We're going to look at, is it ever going to snow? I'm not happy. I can't pretend. Opening day's been delayed again. The ground is brown. I'm waiting around without skiing. What a skier supposed to do in this town? Sitting on a bench doesn't keep me amused. The ski pass I bought hasn't even been used. The weather channel isn't bringing any good news. Is it really winter? Cause I'm kind of confused. What's going on? Is it ever gonna snow? I'm waiting. Is it ever? chance of an inch in a week and skiing on the man-made kind of blows snow is not the same when it comes from a hose i'm sick of complaining i'm tired of whining but i didn't move to this town for the fine dining this weather is scary i came for the ski and i ain't staying for the library is it climate change anyone know i look up man it ain't even trying to snow can i get a cloud a couple of flakes they're worried about the tourists man give me a the ski bumps can't even sleep at night This 10 day forecast can't be right Come on! Is it ever gonna snow? I'm waiting Is it ever gonna snow? All I see is sun Is it ever gonna snow? I'm waiting Is it ever gonna snow? Is it ever gonna snow? All right, I love that video. I really particularly enjoy your line about the tourists and the ski bums. Can you give that to us? Oh yeah. Um, can I get a cloud, a couple of flakes? They're worrying about the tourists, man. Give me a break. The ski bums can't even sleep at night. This 10 day forecast can't be right. Come on. <laughs> so ski bums, you do some other PSAs for town and stuff like that, correct? Yeah, yeah, I've been, uh, well, um, they, they approached me many years ago about doing one about picking up after your dog. So oh, it's a hot um, topic I got in some Telluride? unfortunate notoriety from the, um, the dog poop videos as, as they've been come to, <laughs> you know, come to be known. Um, and, uh, and then I wrote one, um, on my own that I, I kind of wanted to do the, the bears are back in town done to the thin Lizzy song. Um, and I had some, a really willing crew of friends that were willing to, dress in bear outfits and jump into dumpsters so um it's always it's always good to have the help of uh experienced you know, some, actors you, <laughs> they, 
they they sure pulled it off like they were it was great um and then uh i just worked with ken bailey on a uh skier oh, safety um psa which is currently uh shown at the nugget i guess before movies and we did that with the ski club so we have a bunch of the kids in that one and uh cool. that's really relevant to uh, what we're seeing right now with all the uh, crowds of people all on one run yeah, skiing you know like... skiing can be a little scary um when when it gets congested like that so it's well thank you so relevant. much for being here and we look yeah, forward to more for videos me. from lift ticket yeah i hope to make some more so thanks for having me <laughs> Telluride TV has 30 years of archival video records. Everything from 4th of July Parade to Lip Sync, Telluride AIDS Benefit Fashion Show and Children's Theater, as well as festival interviews. Let's start this year off with a nice mellow number. This is a Lip Sync performance from 2004, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood.
If you have your own retro ride videos, please send them to tim at telluridetv.org or tag us at Telluride TV. Now we're going to join Kara Pallone and Katie Klingsborn for Kodo Radio Vision News. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kara. And I'm Katie. And we're, and we're the Kodo, Kodo News team. team. Happy New Year, everybody. Yeah, and what a year it's been. I don't know about you, but my 2017 was pretty epic. I got married and went on the Grand Canyon and had lots of adventures. It's been a great year indeed, but in this installment of Radio Vision, we are going to be talking about a few somber stories, our biggest stories of the year. And the first one, the obvious one, is the Norwood double homicide. And I remember that call coming in on September 8th and just feeling like that whole day was just off and nobody knew any details. And then finally at around six o'clock, Sheriff Bill Masters called Cotto and um, we did a live interview with him on the air and he explained that two young children had been murdered on a farm near Norwood or believed to have been murdered on a farm near Norwood and it just kind of shook the community and we didn't really know details for a long time. They only started to unfold once we were able to get the affidavit unsealed and then just through the court proceedings which are taking place now. Um, recently there was a preliminary hearing for two of the five suspects and the other three have their preliminary hearings on January 18th. And um, of the five, two are facing first-degree murder charges. So yeah. It's yeah. a huge it's story, huge case, very tragic, tragic very sad. bizarre. Mm -hmm. um, so what do we know about the details? Well, like I said, we didn't really know anything for the longest time, but then it kind of um, took, a, I mean, the national news got involved when it surfaced that a voodoo component was involved. And then just the mix of nationalities involved um, Two are of Haitian descent, one from Jamaica, and then two U.S. citizens. So you have this kind of motley crew of nationalities out on a farm in Norwood. The death of two young girls, 10 and 8 years old. And, and then um, just the, the other aspects of it, just a bizarre story. And so, yeah, they're all being held at San Miguel County Jail right now. And that's kind of where it stands. But they were preparing for the end times. And then what yeah. happened to these girls? While they were preparing for the end of times, they were praying, at kind of like sequestered to a portion of the property, and the two girls were banished to a vehicle and essentially starved. So Yeah, really horrible. A horrible. And, you know, I mean, this is the, let's see, Sheriff Master said there's been two other homicides in San Miguel County in his tenure as sheriff, which is 37 years. And so it really is just you know, like I said, shook the community. And you live in Norwood. How did that impact the community there? Right. I mean, it was a terrible shock. Um, like you said, really, I think everyone was heartbroken more than anything and felt a bit of shame that this horrible thing happened right down the road. It's very close to the center of Norwood. Anyone who uh, uh, goes out to the Thunder Trails on a regular basis passes it all the time so that uh, knowing the knowledge that these two little girls were suffering and, you know, nobody could, could do anything to help them, I think was really hard for people to handle. So yeah. definitely people gathered their loved ones in close. and Yeah, and I know it's something that we'll be covering well into 2018, so we will right. keep our listeners and viewers updated. Um, Katie, you came on in October, and then I, you covered kind of our second biggest story of the year. Yeah, um... Right at the end of the Thanksgiving break from school, the night before uh, school was about to start again, they announced that it had been closed due to a shooting threat. Um, and what happened is some students had been texting the, um, over the social media app Snapchat the week before, and one of the students made a, um, quote, Columbine-style threat to the, to the school, and then he also made a threat for explos explosives mm -hmm. that same day on that Monday. And so the school shut down. Um, they brought in the FBI. They did a thorough sweep of campus with bomb sniffers. And they took the student who made the threat um, into custody. Mm -hmm. And they also took two guns mm -hmm. that belonged to his household into custody. And in the end, they determined that 
he actually was not equipped to pull off the thread. It was probably just a thread and a mistake, but it was taken very seriously. Yeah. And in this day and age, officials have to take that stuff very seriously. And, you know, that's how we kind of, and the, just the resources that were used to, Absolutely. you know, that's how we sort of measure what were the biggest stories of the year. And it's how many people they impacted. And with this, with the the shutdown of the schools and just having the community on edge. It really was a big story, and I'm just glad that nothing came of it. Yeah, but, but you know, what did come of it, I would say, is a, a wider community discussion. That's a good point. You know, parents were very concerned, students were scared, and it sort of triggered this conversation mm -hmm. about, um, you know, identifying troubled students, what are the school's policies for evacuations in the case that this would happen and kind of fostering a change in culture within the school itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to our last big story of the year and that is the weather. And if you look outside right now, it's blue sky. I hope to go on a run this afternoon. <sighs> Um, if I have some time, but uh, Telski CEO Bill Jensen was in earlier today on this Tuesday, and um, he said that despite rumors that are going around about the ski resort shutting down, that is absolutely not true. They are making a huge investment into snowmaking, which if you've been on the mountain, you know, and they're committed to making snow through January. They are not shutting down the ski resort. So that's the latest from Bill Jensen. And we're supposed to get a couple snowstorms here soon. Yeah, he said Saturday night is calling for some snow. And then maybe uh, next week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it's looking like something might build for then. And yeah, and Bill said something yeah. when he came in today. He said that closing the ski resort would be the equivalent of building a house and then burning it down. They've done so much work to make sure there is the skiing that there is. And mm -hmm. I actually did a feature about the snowmaking team last week and mm -hmm. they're, they're the heroes of the season. So when this big storm happens, we're going to find a story on the mountain and shred. use it to make a shred. So Katie, what's on tap for this week's Off the Record program on Kodo? Yeah, so I will have some special guests on and we'll be talking about the new year, 2018, and focusing on some major projects that will either have big developments or will go online this year. Uh, we'll be talking about the Lonecon Library, the Transfer Warehouse, and Telluride's affordable housing projects. And for our viewers, if you missed that program, you can always go to Kodo.org. We have it in our archives. Just click the Kodo News tab. And I think that about does it for this installment of Radio Vision. Yeah. Until next time, stay out of the news. Or at least make it a good story. <laughs> Thanks, Karen and Katie, for keeping us informed. Let's head over to David Jasonis with Undercover at Between the Covers Bookstore. Happy New Year from Between the Covers, Tire Eyes, fiercely independent bookshop since 1974. Hopefully you got a bevy of books under the tree or the menorah and you have voraciously read through them all and you need more. Between the Covers can help you with that. Stop in. To highlight what's kind of new this week, um, just released on January 2nd, I'm going to talk about three books. First one being The Meaning of Birds by Simon Barnes. This town is into its birds. Between Jennifer Ackerman's The Genius of Birds that's been on bestsellers since April 2016 to the pocket-sized Birds of Colorado that we sell tons of in the summertime. This town is for the birds. This guy's a British uh, scientist, novelist, and sports writer, and it is a witty celebration of the avian world. Did you know that skylarks can sing forever on a single breath? Are you aware of the infidelities of geese? Honk, honk, it's all in here. He also has a serious side talking about the changing uh, patterns of bird migration that really should be alerting us to uh, contemporary climate change. A beautiful package and if you are collecting bird books like I know a lot of people here are, this is another great selection for your shelf. We're going to move on to some serious historical fiction. This is The Last Suppers, plural, and it is by Mandy Mikulnicek and she lives somewhere in the mountains of the southwest Colorado. Um, 
It's about a character named Ginny Polk, and it's 1950s Louisiana, and it's the Green Mount Penitentiary, um, State Penitentiary. And she works there as the prison cook. Her past history with the place, as with a lot of children who, live, who grew up in the shadow of the penitentiary and having their parents working there, um, her father was murdered at the penitentiary um, on the job when she was eight. Uh, at that time, the system thought it would be a great justice for her to watch um, that inmate um, die on death row. Um, it changed her forever, and she ends up working as the cook and specifically cooking the meals, um, the last request, the last supper that a prisoner would request. Um, she visits the families to get um, the special nuances of the recipes to really make it a memorable last meal. Um, and then uh, at the very end of the book, there is a series of recipes that she has added that have kind of a southern flair. Uh, things like clabber cake, southern spoon bread, and pork neck stew. Um, it's provocative, it's dark, but it is incredibly humanizing. So, moving on to cycling, which there happens to be a lot of right now uh, going on in the region. Um, and people are really enjoying the extended biking season. Um, this is a great book for either those who absolutely are on the road all the time or just armchair cyclists. Um, it's not just about the mountains, cycling's obsession with mountains. It's not just how tall they are, where they are, and the stats of, of the racers that have won there. It's really about the question of why. Why are the mountain ranges the, as he calls it, the coliseum of pro cycling? Um, why are the mountains where the legends are forged? And he also gets into the fact that there are so many pilgrimages by amateur cyclists to just go and ride these high roads all around the world and what's happening in the body and the mind and, and the psychology of when we tackle the big mountains. So um, he wrote, his previous book is Lantern Rouge, so he really kind of drills down into the world of cycling, and that last book of his was about uh, the award given to the last cyclist to cross the line in the Tour de France. He really thought it would be a neat thing to kind of examine the, the last cyclist in. Um, other than that, um, our events are a little bit lean in January, a nice little break, but I do want to bring up that on Tuesday, January 23rd at 6 p.m. at Telluride Arts, uh, San Miguel County Poet Laureate Alyssa Dixon and also Library Gal Extraordinaire will be the featured poet. Uh, we packed the house last year for her. Let's do it again. That's at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, January 23rd. And... Um, the theme that she has picked for the uh, open mic part afterwards is animals. All right, we hope to catch you reading between the covers. Well, Almost Live is almost over. And if you've missed part of the show, never fear. We'll be running at morning, noon, and night on Channel 12. And you can always catch us on Facebook or YouTube. Just go on YouTube and look up Telluride TV and subscribe to our channel. We'll be back with a brand new Almost Live next Friday. Catch you then.